So yeah, I wanted to talk about being human in a creative world. And um, with the theme compassion, for me, when I think about compassion straight away, I think about the bigger things in this world. So the bigger challenges that are happening, whether it's homelessness, poverty, war, famine. There's so many challenges obviously going on in this world. And I think one thing is that for so many of us, we, um, you know, we might walk down the street and we walk past some homeless people, we see the news, we see what's happening. But in our day-to-day -day lives, we're maybe in front of a screen or in the office or whatever your workplace is, we're quite removed from that. So I wanted to share a story about something that really, a time in my life that really impacted me and kind of, I guess, made me realize how crazy lucky we have it. Many of you will have seen the news recently um, in Burma, where the Rohingya, uh, Rohingya, it's quite a tough one to say, community, there's a lot of ethnic cleansing going on by the Burmese government. It's insane how, what's happening over there, the people that are having to escape over to Bangladesh for the safety of their lives. Now, it's not a new thing. You know, in Burma, it's been happening 60 years. It's the longest civil war in history. So with that, I've done a lot of work on the other, one of the other borders, where it's Burma and Thailand. So we work with the Karen people mainly. So they come from an area that's very, it's very dense jungle. There's not many schools. There's a lot of kind of history of landmines and of war in that area. It was getting better many years ago when I was doing a lot of work there. It's starting to get a wee bit worse again. One year when I was there, we were working um, at our school called Thonwee Key, which is right on the border, and it's got about 700 kids. So those kids grew up in the Karen state where there's no schools. The parents sent them over to Thailand to get an education where there's schools for the migrant kids that many international NGOs support. There was one day, one trip when we were there, and these two kids had arrived the day before. And um, Peacefully, who runs the school with us, he's from the Karen state, he said, yeah, I, they just turned up yesterday. I kind of quite like to know their story. So we said, well, can we, you know, can we sit down with them? You translate and you can you know, tell, us, tell us what's happening. And um, these kids essentially had been dropped off the day before at the gate to the school. We don't know who by. It was either an uncle or a family member. And they were basically told just, you know, where you go, knock on the school. And that was it. They didn't know when anyone was coming back for them, where they were. They were just told, go and knock on the door. So we, you know, it was obviously quite a tough situation and uh, me and my workmate were kind of asking, you know, is there anything you need? And um, they said, we have a t-shirt, we have a pair of shorts and we're being fed. We have everything we need in life. And we're just, you know, they started crying, we started crying. It was kind of like, it's a very me memorable moment in your life. And, you know, when you look into these kids' eyes, it was, for me it was like, jeepers, we really did win life's lottery being here. For so many of us, we have such a lucky situation. So today, though, I wanted to talk about the little things. And um, for me, it goes back, really, to when I was 18, 19, studying photography in Scotland. We lad in Aberdeen, growing up. My first ever, first ever music gig that I was photographing. So I was learning photography, and I was like, I want to go and photograph a gig. And here's this hip hop, two hip hop bands from America, the Arsonists and the Souls of Mischief. And I'm in the front row, you know, I'm probably a bit sure I'm not the tallest, but I'm probably a bit shorter than I was. And I'm kind of bouncing around with the camera trying to get a shot. <laughs> and, um, and it was an amazing feeling. I was like, this is awesome. I'm kind of bouncing with a beat, trying to get, get things going. Um, obviously, I still had a bit to learn about um, shutter speeds and, you know, what. what <laughs> what speed of film I had to use, but you know, we'll, go, we'll say the blurred, the blurred style is kind of creative there. So, um, <laughs> but for me, you know, it was that moment. Like, it was so amazing just waiting, what is the moment that I'm capturing? What is that moment on, and, it, and this was film. You know, Digi wasn't really around then. Like, I was just, I think our college had one digital camera. And to borrow it, you know, you had to kind of like, basically lend them your left arm because it was so valuable at that time. So it was all, you know, it was capturing things on film, where, of course, you know, everyone who shot film, you know, you can't just shoot a thousand images and see what they look like. You've got to really press that button at the right time. So you're constantly just waiting for that exact moment when you can actually capture it. So for me, that really is, is something I've been in for many years now, you know, since, since I was um, 
20, now 37, so it's been quite a few years of photography, and I've learned lots over that time, and I've had so much fun just searching for that moment. And um, just got a few examples here, you know, from, from Ripon Festival, where I was their um, official photographer for 10 years, and I was lucky enough to just get to capture everything on stage, backstage, so from Johnny Tugu, Tiki Tane, and Warren Maxwell, just at that exact moment, when obviously, I'm guessing it's probably Warren cracking the joke there, to the year before when Johnny Tugu actually had long hair and just jumped up and started crowd surfing, and I was just luckily in the right place at the right time and got that shot. To Fly My Pretties, where I worked as their photographer, um, especially during Fly My Pretties 2, and um, just getting to kind of capture those moments with you know, such a mix of musicians in the crowd. And just those little things that often you don't notice. You know, this guy here absolutely cracking up. Like, not many people would see him there. But it was so much fun just getting to capture these moments. To the portraits and all the people that I photographed. Um, and that moment, like Anne's Westra, we were interviewing her, photographing her, and we were saying goodbye. And she just stepped under this bare light bulb. And I had one frame left on um, my film. And I was like, Anne, stop, snap, got it. And it was just, for me, it was just one of those moments I remember. Like Mara TK from Electric Wire Hustle, we're literally within five minutes of meeting him. He's such a gentle soul, and he was just cracking up, and we got the shot within you know, five minutes of just us chatting him. So then, back to Burma, where just absolute lucky timing, right place, right time. I'd arrived there on a budget trip. The water was out at the school that we work at, so the kids were all going down the river for a bath. Technically, it's no man's land. That's Thailand on that side. That's Burma. This is a class. It's no man's land. Luckily, it's knee deep the water. So I just walked in because I actually didn't have my 40s or anything with me at that time, but had my camera. And these kids were just doing backflips. And lucky enough, just managed to capture that exact moment with the right time and with you know, the right aperture that really just kind of froze that water there and that shutter speed. So for me, it really has been about searching for those ultimate moments in time. Now, for you, it might be the perfect font, the perfect design grid, the perfect cut in a video, whatever, whatever industry you're in. It is, you know, it's those winning moments that we get that we absolutely love and that we absolutely thrive on. And I think as creatives, we are absolutely incredible at taking things in and just observation and really you know, looking at the room and looking at what's going on. Kind of like this kid here where uh, there was a crazy game of dodgeball. I don't know what the actual technical term in Burma for it was, but basically there was about 50 kids running like mad throwing balls at each other. So I assume it was something like dodgeball. And this kid was just silent, just watching, watching the madness going on around him. And I think for me, that's something I've learned as a documentary photographer is that we are really good at just spotting the little things and just always having our eyes open, always observing the room, always observing what's happening and what are those perfect moments. You know, I don't have my camera on me at all times, but I guess you kind of store those Kodak moments in your head so often. So it might be, you know, the street artist who's actually looking for the perfect canvas or the skater who's actually looking for that perfect playground. Everyone in their creative field knows what it's like to view things differently and to really have an eye for those little details that many other people might not see. Now, I feel that because of that, it makes us, um, it kind of gives us the perfect grounding to show more compassion, to be more human. We're always kind of observing that world around us and we're taking in those little things. You know, people, emotions, the vibe of a room, we're kind of always weighing that up and seeing what's going on. And I wanted to come back to a quote that I absolutely love from an amazing musician, Warren Maxwell from Trinity Roots. We interviewed Warren um, quite a few years ago now about music and generosity. And um, I'll read the full quote, it's got us the end of it here. He basically said, Guaranteed, when there's any kind of disaster or famine, it will be the musician and bands that bring people together to raise money and awareness of what's happening. Music and musicians have a sincere ability to bring people together for an event, and in doing so, create ancient rituals that make a community. Which 
to me, it's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. And um, it's not just musicians, obviously. It's, it's, it's all, especially, you know, the creatives. That's the one thing, you know, I'm talking from my experience, that creatives for me are the people that always jump in, always dive, always help out to make things happen, especially in times of need. Um, and a big part of it is obviously we're helping people, but we're also, we just love what we do. We love our creativity. You know, I'm sure many of you don't always see it as work. Obviously, there's some days where you know, it's quite hard work, but you know, while I'm at a gig nowadays, if I don't have my camera, I'm always taking the photo in my head or pulling out my iPhone and not getting anything at all that is usable in any way, but you know, <laughs> kind of feel like I'm trying to do it. So I've been lucky enough through a huge mixture of projects and roles that I've worked in to work with a huge mix of creatives. And I wanted to talk about some of those projects and some of those examples now. So, from way back in the day, I um, will say way back in the day, it, was, um, it would have been over 10 years ago, I studied graphic design at uh, when it was NatCol, now UB. So I did you know, the nine month course there, and uh, my end, end project was a publication, because I'd been photographing musicians every weekend anyway. I needed to find a way to actually get that out onto the streets. So we started a magazine, and um, it was a way of us really just interviewing amazing characters in New Zealand, amazing creatives. Some of them really well known, some of them we were actually the first um, profile and interview they'd ever done, and now many of them have gone on to do big things. So for us, that was our part in kind of the creative community, and here's, you know, here's a mixture of some of those um, stories. I won't leave it up long enough for you to read some of Taika's answers, because you'll probably be offended. Uh, but they were very entertaining when we actually uh, read those, so you can uh, challenge you to see if you can find that somewhere. So, with, um, with exposure, you know, it was photographers, designers, typographers. With the Good Karma project, I went out to Thailand and worked on the border and taught kids photography and art for six weeks. We brought that back and we then worked with a huge mix of artists, illustrators, designers, documentary makers, and we created a publication, a documentary, and an exhibition. And one of the main things for us was we brought back the kids' art that they had done in Thailand, and we gave that to New Zealand creatives. So we asked a mix of, it was around about 15 creatives, that exhibition, and we said, can you basically pick which of these artworks you're inspired by and create your interpretation of it? So this was Andy Shaw, you know, a digital artist here who created this one. But we had a huge mix of people, from Flops to Cut Collective to Misery, who all just donated that little bit of time to do something they loved, which then helped us raise $10,000, which went back to help those kids with their schooling their education, their agriculture, uh, sorry, an agriculture project. And then from that, with Misery, we started the Little Lotus project. Misery was so inspired, she said, hey, how can, how can I get involved, what can I do? So we started a Little Lotus project. I managed that with her through the charity that I started working at. And um, we went out, four of us went out to Thailand and started working with the kids again on an art project. The following year, we inspired 13 people to come out from around the world. So we had artists from Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, and the States. And we worked with those kids on art projects. We then again brought that art back, and we did a number of things. We had a bigger exhibition this time, we raised $40,000. We had people like Michael Tuffrey involved, and then he came along to actually teach the kids um, from schools around Wellington about what the project was about and the background there, because he absolutely just loved chatting to those kids and sharing the story of his piece of art and the story of the kids from Burma who had created the inspiration for that art. You know, here's one of the kids here. We worked with a Burmese hip hop group were actually, who were actually in hiding from the government. And they actually um, created um, a song in Karen with beats that were being supplied by DJ Babu from Dilated Peoples in the States. And we created then some tracks with New Zealand musicians who took those sounds and created their mix of it. To Spinning Top, which is the charity that ran a lot of these projects that I ended up managing um, for five years. And one of the big things I'll point out with that is the comedy show. We do it every year as part of the International Flick Comedy Fest. And um, with that, essentially every comedian donates their time. And um, we've had amazing people, you know, Ursula Carlson, Michelle Accord, Ben Hurley, Di Henwood. Michelle has this awesome quote where uh, she told us once that 
she couldn't believe that her jokes built a school. Like she was like, Pat, literally this is the least I can do. I get up and tell jokes. I'm not changing the world, I'm telling jokes. But you guys give me the platform to build a school for 200 kids in the jungle there. And it's amazing, we've now done that 10 years. Because those musicians, uh, musicians, comedians, just know that that little bit of time that they're giving means that they can inspire so many people. And then on to 1% Collective, which really is for me, you know, now the biggest thing that I'm working on. Four days a week, I run 1%. We um, work with a small lineup of New Zealand charities, and we inspire people to donate 1% of their income on a regular basis. We pass 100% on, and we've almost hitting the half a million dollar mark raised. So I just wanted to show a few of the projects there. I've got a little video as the next one. So we worked with Mark Alveston in the sweet shop and a whole number of creatives to create these videos quite a few years ago. Some of you would have seen it, some of you might never have seen it. So I'm just gonna play this one. All the kids in my street will be thinking about the future. Yeah. Mm. In the future, I'll um, go to rainbows and... She's going to be really happy with a big house. Um, I'll be a doctor. I want to change like buildings, the ways people travel. It'll be tidy. Um, kids will play around like, on the back. Instead of cars, we got roller coasters and we just run around and then we jump off to like our friend's house. I would cure um, heart attacks. Um, I would cure sickness. And the last thing I would cure is hay fever. simple. The future's in our hands. My mum and dad will probably be dead by um, if they were in the future. Just think, if everybody in the whole earth, they stayed alive for the rest of the time, well, the earth won't grow. It'll just, it won't grow. There'll be like 104, 105, like in the hundreds or the thousands. I don't know. Start giving through the 1% collective charity and we can save all of our worlds. Done. <laughs> so we were... Uh... <laughs> so we were l really lucky to get, you know, their support and then um, through that we also created a crazy billboard on the side of Inject Design there and worked with some crew from Weta to engineer that and this way up to put it up. And um, you know, from that campaign we got a lot of donors. What we also got was we inspired more creatives and we got the good folk in Auckland who said, hey, how can we help? We love what you're up to, we love your ethos, we love what you're trying to do, how can we help? And we said, well, we're just starting this idea of a generosity journal. So they helped us with the initial issues and the template and we've managed to you know, continue that and work with amazing creatives and amazing supporters to bring that to life. Um, we then took the cover from the recent one and worked with the Fox and Co crew and FIO, who I don't know if any of them are here, but I know they come quite often. And we just created this short 15 second animation of the cover. And then to musicians who worked so much with us. This was Adam Page many years ago at Zero playing a Friday night drink session there and us talking about generosity. So it's all these amazing creatives that we've got to work with over the years um, that really, you know, they feel the compassion for those that we're working for. And even though they don't meet these people, they know that using their creativity and getting involved, they can create change and they can help people, you know, who aren't as lucky as us. So I wanted you to think about what does compassion, creativity, and being human look like in your world and in your creative world or your everyday world? You know, it might be volunteering your skills, 
or donating on the regular. It might be taking time to listen more and to help more people at work. Coop could be as simple as emptying the dishwasher. You know, referring lots to the biz dojo here where, you know, <laughs> the, the always problem of a kitchen dishwasher. It could be just saying thank you to the checkout operator and looking them in the eye and saying thank you and really just being human. Comes back to that Trinity Roots line. It's the little things that really matter. So that ripple effect of those little things is amazing. You know, when you start doing more little things, inspire more people, it of course ripples out and everyone starts doing it. There's a quote from um, Charles Eisenstein that is, even if no one ever finds out about your act of compassion, even if the only visible witness is a dying person, the effect is no less than if someone makes a feature documentary about it, which I thought was quite nice. It's also, it's good for your, your head, your heart, and your immune system. That's proven. So, you know, there's a lot of benefits there with compassion. And really, the byproduct is, we go back to the big things. All of those little things we're doing, it all comes back and it does impact the big things. You know, compassion is a trained trait. Like, we train ourselves, we train those around us, and everyone starts showing a lot more compassion. When we talk about the meaning, a strong feeling of empathy and sadness for the suffering or bad luck of others, and a wish to help, I think the biggest thing is the end there, a wish to help. Like, as creatives, we're so good at getting things done. So I think that's a big part, is the doing things, the doing something. And it really as well just comes back to, for us, that value that we talk about at 1% Collective, or 1% Collective, 1% Collective, of be human. So a really important value there. Now, with that in mind, I just had a little call to action at the end. In November, we're launching a campaign around for people who give a percent. We've already got 330 people involved in the collective. We'd love to really boost those numbers and really start that momentum going. So of course, if anyone wants to sign up with the 1%, definitely gonna encourage that. But one ask I have is, so many amazing creatives in the room, I'd love if anyone wants to get in touch and be part of a small kind of advisory group where we can really help boost this campaign with creative ideas, I'd love to get a bunch of brains helping us do what we do. There's only a tiny team of two of us do four days a week, so that's why we reach out to so many creatives there. So um, here's my email, or come and see me after. Massive thanks to Elise and the, the team who all volunteer, and to you guys for coming down to listen to me. Thanks for your generosity. Cheers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yay, thank you. Mm. Who's got a question? Oh, oh, oh I've got here first. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's always it's always friends and family first. Um, so we we started with something we didn't know. How on earth do you fund the startup of a charity that isn't your normal charity? You know, we're kind of a meta charity. We're trying to inspire more generosity to help other organisations. Um, so we came up with something called the Founding Forty, where we wanted forty people to give twenty dollars a week for a year. So we'd have forty thousand. Of course, my first thing was, let's go to businesses and wealthy people. They didn't reply. They didn't you know, know who I was. So I sent an email to friends and family saying, do you know any wealthy people? Do you know any business people that might be part of a Finding 40? And they were all like, oh, gee, I love what you do. I'll just be one. It's 20 bucks a week. It's like you can barely get an Eggs Benedict for that nowadays. You know? <laughs> so, so that was it. It was, it's always, yeah, friends and family. And that's you know, what we talk about a lot is like you kind of have to build out from that friends and family. There. And especially with no, for us, with no real marketing budget, you know, tiny marketing budget, we have to rely on the contacts, the collective, and the friends of to make things happen. Yeah. Jake, I think there's one. Um, how do you manage your emotion to be able to be, like, how does it not cross you? <laughs> it's, um, I guess there's a few sides to it. Like, when I first started at Spinning Top, um, my workmate Shelley was amazing at kind of teaching me that you will get used to no's. That she was like, you'll get one yes you know, for 10 no's. 
And um, when my workmate Ruben started at 1%, I think he was the same. He was like, why? I sent this out to all my friends. Why haven't they all signed up straight away? And I, we all know that it takes, it takes time. You know, people, and we have a lot of people, I've been meaning to sign up for years, and I've just done it today. And we're like, awesome. We know that that's it. Um, and so I think I've got this I've kind of weird thing. I don't know if it's a negative thing or not. I kind of find it all right that I, I kind of go into a lot of things expecting no is going to be the answer. And then when I get a yes, I'm like, this is amazing. You know, <laughs> literally just before I walked in here, I got a text. And I thought it was my partner going, good luck. But it was actually Warren Maxwell, who I texted a few nights ago, and going, hey, Warren, do you want to play our fifth birthday? Totally expecting a no, because he's so busy. And he's like, Pat, I'd be honored. I'm like, oh, amazing. So you know, it's those, it, for me, it is kind of like, hey, I know that um, I can't expect. We ask a lot, and we know that we're not always going to get yeses. So when you do, they're just even more amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's um, that's a rubbish dump right on the Thai Burma border, and um, we worked there for many years. There's a school called Sky Blue School, and then um, we supported them with a lunch program and with their teacher um, wages. Basically, people who've left Burma have a few options. They're getting away from all the crazy stuff that's happening in the jungle. Um, you know. Same as what we're seeing now, but it was happening in their, in their area, in the Karen state. So they either come into Thailand as migrants, where they're either migrant workers, or they go into a refugee camp, where, of course, you've then got food being provided, and you've got the option of being relocated to other countries. So many people, though, decide that they want to kind of be in charge of their own lives. And for those people living on a rubbish dump, collecting the recycling, selling it to the recyclers, they get about five bucks a day for a family of seven, I think we worked with. For them, that's their choice and they're in control rather than being in a refugee camp where they're told what to do. It's a, it was a whole, you know, such a sad situation um, to be in and um, to walk around and to meet these people. But for us, it was amazing getting to build that school, feed the lunches so that the kids didn't have to be on the rubbish dump. They could actually get an education there. So it's pretty much, um, we, we have 11 charities that we work with. And um, people, when they sign up, they can share their donation between any number of those 11. So it might be that someone gives 20 bucks a week, and they like three of our charities. And then with us, we, every quarter, we total that up, and we pass on 100% of it to the organizations that we work with. With those organizations, it's untagged funding. So a lot of the time, the challenge for organizations is they'll put in a grant for a specific project, and they don't really have much scope to do anything outside of that. But you know, things change. Life changes. For us, we look at the small to medium-sized organizations that we've audited, we've worked with, we've learned what their plans, what their vision is. And we want to support them with regular funding so that they're not constantly stressing about the up and down of grant funding or running events that, as we all know, take a lot of effort. And you, know, you might not actually make that much profit in the end. So for us, it's, it's a lot about that, working with them, storytelling. How can we get you untagged funding? How can we help? How can we help your processes, your governance? Um, and that's why we kind of work with the small to medium size. You know, The big charities are doing awesome work, but they're sorted. They've been around a long time. They've got their systems. They've got funding. It's those small kind of underdogs that are doing things you know, that um, are trying to do things different that we really want to try and back as, as much as we can. And with the whole be open thing that we talk about, what another one of our values, it's also just being honest. If they're having challenges, we're like, tell us. Like, we know it's hard. Like, please see how we can help. So, yeah. Um, so November is the big thing. Yeah, November we're kind of looking at we'll have around about 350 donors. You know, how can we over 12 months, you know, go to over a thousand donors? So when I talk about a campaign, we've already got you know our plans for that. We're just kind of working on it further, uh, but that's where we kind of need need brains to really just come and help us fine tune some of those ideas, um, as well as our generosity journals, which I've left a bunch outside. I've even got I think a few of the old issues. So Feel free to grab some of those. We're going to be working with the sweet shop and Mark Alberston again to produce a series of four videos. So we're lucky enough that they're wanting to work with us in their New Zealand and international offices to basically help really crank the movement there of generosity. So that's definitely our big up and coming thing. Yeah. And, and the organization that you were supporting, um, you know, are they, I mean, I, I know that you 
doing a whole lot of work with children, you know, with other mm. babies. Is that your passion, you know, to make, to improve things for children? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely a big thing. You know, I, I don't have any kids, but one, you know, one day it's kind of, yeah, that challenge when we see, you know, the, the big things that are happening in the world, of course, we want to we wanna improve that and we don't want to leave things worse, worse off. Um, so a lot of the organizations, well, it's not that, um, well, it's not that children are a solid focus of an organization having to be with us. We really just, yeah, do want to work with the organizations and be like, what is your future dreams? You know, why do you exist? What impact is that going to have on the future? And so, and how can we help that? Because, yeah, we know that's going to be uh, so important that we deal with things now. Yeah. Last question. Dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. No questions? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. No? I, I Go. Go. Oh, you can go. Um, uh, any of your, uh, any, any of the charities based in New Zealand, are they all international? Or? Yeah, so they're, they're all, so we talk about Kiwi based charities because pretty much their whole teams are here and they're, you know, they're registered here. Two of the organisations we work with do work internationally, but it is mainly New Zealand. Um, as you can obviously tell from my history, um, I believe we should be supporting things in New Zealand and abroad because there's so many challenges abroad and there's governments that don't care. You know, they're killing their people rather than looking after them. So I believe that, yes, we should completely support our own country and all that's going on, and we should be supporting these people that have no one else to help them. There was a village that burnt down in, uh, in the jungle, and we got a call from Peacefully, and he said, 28 out of 35 houses have been burnt down. The parents were out in the fields. The grandmothers and the kids were there. A few of the kids got burnt. All of their villages are gone. I mean, half, most of the village is gone. And he said, they're in the jungle. There's no insurance. There's no government. No one there to look after them. So we said, what would it cost to help rebuild that village? And it was $4,000. Like, each house we worked out was $75. Like, jeepers. Imagine, uh, imagine getting a house in New Zealand for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, we, we supported. And, and that was it. Like, you know, there was no one else for them to turn to. It was just that we luckily knew peacefully. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. 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 Thank you.